So thanks and welcome to everyone to this information session for the Cambridge um, Digital Humanities PhD programme. Um, I think probably everyone's coming now who's going to be joining, people are still trickling in. So just to introduce myself, I'm Anne Alexander. Uh, I'm a member of the teaching team here at CDH and I'm Director of Learning. Um, joined by a number of colleagues today, just to explain the format of the session. Um, we're going to have a presentation from Leo Impet in a minute, who's going to talk through what the programme looks like. Um, we uh, encourage you to use the Q&A uh, function to ask questions. Um, you're welcome to put in questions while Leo is speaking, and then we'll be picking them up in a Q&A session. We'll be answering, answering questions. Um, feel free to, um, as I said, use that during the uh, uh, during the presentation if you want. Um, we are recording the session, um, so everything will be recorded, including answers to questions, and this is to obviously benefit um, uh, you if you uh, didn't want to take a note of everything, but also then we'll be making that available for people who couldn't uh, attend the session. Um, so I will in introduce Leo, who's also going to introduce some of the other members of the team. Leo, over to you. Thanks very much, Anne, um, and thanks everyone for coming. This is the uh, the last of the PhD information webinars, um, and we will be, as Anne said, we're going to be recording the whole session. Um, none of you will be in the recording in terms of video or voice or image or anything like that, but we will be reading your questions out, so please bear that in mind. We won't be reading your names out, but we will be reading the questions out. Um, I'm Leo Impet. I uh, have been at Cambridge Digital Humanities now for a few years, and I uh, originally studied engineering, so I've got a background in machine learning and computer vision, and especially in applying those things to art history and thinking about the intersection, if you like, between AI and visual culture. And before I go into the little spiel about CDH and the new PhD program, um, I'll just give my colleagues here the opportunity to say a few words about their own uh, research and who they are. So maybe starting with Julia. Uh, yes, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Julia Grisot. I'm also one of the teacher of the Master in Digital Humanities. Um, particularly, I do teach a course in distant reading, uh, so I'm interested in texts and how we can explore computationally patterns that relate to culture and humanities uh, using computational digital methods. Um, I'm a linguist as a background, an applied linguist, um, interested in literary texts uh, historically, but also applying uh, text mining techniques to any kind of culturally relevant texts. Uh, yes, nice to be here. Thanks. Um, Jonathan? Hi everyone, I'm Jonathan. I'm a research software engineer at CDH. My background is in digital libraries and text collections, and I'm particularly interested in minimal computing, which is where we try to be frugal, both computationally and environmentally with what we're doing digitally. Thanks, Jonathan. And Hugo. Hi, all. Um, well, I'm Hugo Biel. I'm, I would say that I'm disciplinary and institutionally all over the place. So I'm a research associate at CRASH at the Mindaroo Center for Technology and Democracy as well, and in a project called AI for Trust, AI-based technologies for trustworthy solutions against disinformation. Um, I am, I would say, political sociologist, political scientist, and currently my main research interest is indeed uh, online misinformation and disinformation, but uh, I've been looking at how things from ideas to people spread both online and uh, offline. And at uh, the Amphield and at CDH, I think it will be mostly interesting in, in the topics I cover. I will cover uh, everything from technological determinism to the political economy of the internet, uh, social movements, collective action, internet cultures and subcultures. Thanks, thanks very much, Hugo. Um, normally in these things, we would be also joined by our wonderful um, administrative uh, assistant, Suzanne Daly, who handles all of uh, the 
digital humanities, teaching, administration, all of the applications, all of the difficult funding, um, paperwork, and so on and so on and so on. Unfortunately, she's not here today, but we do have Anna Fox, who's also uh, working in the English faculty and may well be able to help with some of our admin questions. But um, please do forgive us if we're not able to answer anything on that side. Um, we can always follow up with an email. Good. I'm going to share my screen now for a very, very quick presentation. What I'm going to do is actually skip through many of the slides. In the past two PhD information sessions that we've run, um, we had something like 25 minutes of talking by me, and then there's always not enough time for discussion at the end. And this is a really, really valuable uh, space for having a sort of open forum for questions about the PhD program. And it's especially important because this is the first year that we're running a PhD program. And so, you know, some of the things that you might raise might help to shape um, what we do as well as interrogate it, as it were. So I'm going to be very, very quick on this. And uh, hopefully I'll be done in 10 minutes, 12 minutes tops. And then we can move over to a Q&A. And I'm really looking forward to your questions and thoughts. So we normally start with a whole spiel about, well, what is the digital humanities? Um, I won't give you the whole spiel, but I will say that it's a very new and exciting and open field and it's a very warm and friendly community digital humanities as an intellectual community a lot of people say that you know it's not just my impression every digital humanities center and department has its own if you like interpretation of what that means um, some things might be closer to information studies information science some of them might be closer to computer science some of them might be very very heavily invested in english literature some of them might be closer to media studies and media theory. Um, I think the strength of CDH, of Cambridge Digital Humanities, is that it tries to get, in a sense, that whole spread, that whole gamut of different work that falls under the digital humanities umbrella, and not just allow it to happen in parallel under the same roof or something like that, but really try and create some kind of dialogue between those different strands. So there'll be people working on what is, you know, almost a kind of hard AI machine learning project that will be talking to people who are really doing something that is close to media philosophy, that will be talking to people who are doing, you know, natural language processing of classical languages or something like that. And we really feel that there's something to be gained in this interaction. There's something that comes out of that that is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, so that's, that's, if you like, the particular Cambridge slant on CDH. On DH rather. What is CDH? Well, CDH is institutionally very, very complex. We are a, um, a relatively new center in Cambridge, and that means that we have tentacles in lots of different departments and areas of the university. We work a lot under the English faculty. That's where our teaching happens. We also work with CRASH. CRASH is the main interdisciplinary research center of the humanities at Cambridge. Um, and so a lot of our research falls under that remit. We also work very heavily with the collections, with the Fitzwilliam Museum, with the University Library and so on, and throughout the humanities and social science. Um, something that I really want to point out in that, which is a real strength, I feel, of Cambridge and of Cambridge Digital Humanities, is the wealth of intellectual culture that um, is not something that's easy to create artificially, actually. Um, we have a very, very dense set of research seminar series that's coordinated brilliantly by Hugo, who is here, um, with a lot of visiting speakers from all around the world. Some are UK-based, but many are from Europe or even from the rest of the world, from very different disciplinary backgrounds. So we've had artists just in the last few months. We've had digital artists. We've had people involved in digital politics. We've had people who are closer to the social science side. We've had people who are really on the AI ethics side. We've had people who are very collections heavy. We've just, at the start of this week, had someone talking about um, audiovisual archives. And that really adds a sense of intellectual community. We also tend to do them in the early evening and we serve free drinks afterwards. So there's very high attendance from across the uh, research community, both graduate students and um, researchers, staff, faculty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, they're a great meeting point. And to have the resources to bring people in like that is also wonderful. We complement that, if you like, with our own internal lecture series. Now, you might think, well, all courses are a lecture series. Yes, all courses are made up of lectures. But this is 
this is more like a kind of research seminar series that is run, I want to say internally. What I mean by that is it's run largely with talks from people who are members of CDH and are here. Um, and the theme for that, at least in the past year, well, in this academic year, is theories and frameworks of DH. So what are the different theoretical perspectives that we can use to try and understand the different aspects of the digital humanities? But again, this isn't just a course. This is really people talking about their cutting edge research or things that are still in preparation. You know, people invest very, very heavily in, in giving these uh, lectures. And they're also a great kind of reference point of the graduate research community at Cambridge. And of course, one of the really exciting things about Cambridge um, is the wealth of research networks, research groups, reading groups, seminar groups, et cetera, et cetera, across the university, across the arts, humanities, social sciences, computer science, mathematics, et cetera. Um, the ecosystem here is really unparalleled. You know, it's very, very, very difficult for me in my own professional experience, at least, to find uh, something that can compete with it in uh, anywhere in the world. The density of very short, very intense, very research uh, heavy terms makes it quite a special place to be a PhD student, I think. And especially in the digital humanities, that often involves actually going to other people's stuff. So coming to all of Cambridge Digital Humanities research events, but also maybe attending the ones of, say, computational linguistics or music or archaeology or anthropology or computer science, you know, machine learning groups, AI groups, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I certainly find that with my current PhD students, maybe we have a, a brief bracket on that because people will think, well, hang on, this is the first year the PhD is running. Yes, but we do already have four or five PhD students in the digital humanities as part of CDH. They're just not officially registered on this program because this program is new. Um, but they are supervised by CDH staff. They're done through other programs like English, like history, et cetera. Anyway, um, we find that that is also a really important part of, of what it means to do digital humanities research at Cambridge. So, you know, I have a student working on computational aspects for art history, going very, very, um, investing heavily in the, uh, if you like, research ecosystem of art history and visual studies, which I also participate in, and coming to the Cambridge Digital Humanities event. So it's a real sort of networked ecosystem. It's very open. You can even do things like audit courses. Um, in general, any student at Cambridge can audit any course at Cambridge with the lecturer's permission. So it's all very, very open, very free. Okay, um, I'm not gonna talk long about the structure because um, I promised I'd not take up too much of your time, but you might see a slightly weird nomenclature. This always changes between institutions, between countries. We have two formally default, uh, de formally default rinds, formally defined roles in a Cambridge PhD. One is the supervisor and one is the advisor. And the idea is that the advisor is often someone who is in a kind of relatively um, similar subject. So they might well be someone inside CDH. They don't need to be a particular subject specialist to the same degree as the supervisor, but they give you, if you like, a second opinion on things. Um, they're a real point of reference to get a sort of fresh pair of eyes on your PhD as you progress. And they're a really, really important part of um, what supervision means at Cambridge. So it's a slightly different setup to what some institutions have in terms of co-supervision. You might still have co-supervision at Cambridge, but there's also this advisor role, which I think is really important and quite heavily involved, especially in the first and last year. We've got a full-time and a part-time option. And digital humanities especially is, well, I'm really proud actually of how digital humanities as a field and Cambridge Digital Humanities specifically as an institution is really open to people with significant, uh, let's say professional expertise, as well as people who are just going through directly through an academic career path, right? So we get lots of great PhD inquiries and actually lots of really good master students um, who are not coming directly from the stage before in their academic uh, chain, if you like, but have had years or even decades out in the real world, sometimes working on things that are quite close to digital humanities, sometimes working on things that are completely different, sometimes working on things that give them skills that they bring to their research, like maybe in digital marketing or whatever. 
Anyway, as part of that, we're really keen also to offer that part-time option for people whose lives mean that they can't just take four years and move to Cambridge and leave everything else behind. That has implications on things like residency requirements. So there is a residency requirement for full-time students at Cambridge. There is a softer general expectation of a certain number of days, but not a hard and fast rule for part-time students. So it's worth bearing in mind. The fees are the same. They just get divided up differently. The thesis is uh, nice and long. There's been lots of pressure in UK uh, academia to shorten theses because um, it takes less time to examine shorter ones. Specifically, the English faculty at Cambridge has resisted this urge. So we have a higher word count than most PhDs, even at Cambridge, which can only write 60,000 words. We get an extra 20. Um, and there is there are no compulsory credits as part of the Cambridge PhD in Digital Humanities. This is also similar for many other PhD programs in the humanities at Cambridge. So you don't have to pass, you know, first year graduate course in Digital Humanities with a written exam or anything like that. Rather, you go to classes and seminars, including the CDH ones, throughout your PhD degree. Um, we don't prescribe how many of them you have to go to. There's some compulsory research training, but that's very, very light touch. Um, but rather, it's a kind of organic um, engagement with graduate classes, graduate seminars, graduate reading groups throughout your PhD that follows the directions of the research you're interested in. And I've already said something about the Rider research community, but also we offer specific training and development sessions. And Alexander, you know, is leading an immensely successful um, graduate training program at CDH. Jonathan Blaney also here. Uh, is leading our technical sessions that have also been extremely successful. So we've got we've got a really solid infrastructure there for giving all sorts of skills. They might be to do with specific technical skills. They might be to do with data ethics. They might be you know a whole gamut of things um, to digital humanities graduate students. Last thing, and then I promise I'll shut up. Applicant background. Um, we get all sorts of um, emails from people saying, "Look, I've got a academic background in." insert discipline here. I'm really interested in the digital, but I'm worried because I haven't got a digital humanities degree. Can I still apply for this program? And the answer in all cases is if the research proposal is interesting, and if you feel you can demonstrate you've got the skills to do it, then absolutely yes. We are extremely open to different forms of expertise within the arts and humanities and beyond the arts and humanities. So we've had students with a technical background. You know, I have a background as an engineer and now find myself as a, uh, a, a faculty member in, in the English department. We've got students with a fine arts background, so people who've gone to art school. We've got, and you know, and have also been extremely successful. We've got students who come from more traditional humanities disciplines, classical archaeology, uh, English literature, modern foreign languages, etc, etc. Um, and we've got students, uh, if you like, from, from um, STEM and so on. There is a um, academic threshold. So we say the equivalent of a UK, uh, merit in a UK master's. Um, we recognize that that threshold is not a hard and fast rule. There can be all sorts of, there can be all sorts of arguments in an application for why that threshold is not applicable. One of those might be significant professional experience since your last degree since your master's. One of those might be significant research experience uh, and so on and so on. Okay, I'm gonna skip through the application details because these are just things that are already on the website. Um, and what I'm gonna do is, there's a little, <laughs> a terrible little map of where we are. And we're in lots of different places. What I'm gonna do is just put on the contact us slide. Um, we'll put those in the chat as well and hand over back to Anne for our Q&A session. Thanks very much. Um, yes, thank you very much, Leo. So uh, we've got a few questions coming in. Um, and in terms of the question about slides being available after, Leo, are we making the slides available after? Yes, I think the whole recording will be available after. Um, and I'm more than happy to put you know, a PDF version of the slides as well. But the slides that I've skipped through are reduced versions of the information that is publicly there on the website. So the best thing to do really is to go to the website and that's where you'll find the most up-to-date uh, and the most um, fully fleshed out information. 
Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, let's just try and gather a few questions. So um, there's a question um, about uh, supervisors. Um, so there's a question, can one propose a supervisor from a different institution? Um, so I don't know, would somebody like to perhaps take that question and could maybe also answer the question, does contact need to be made with a potential supervisor before the application is sent? Um, anyone from the panel like to pick up on that one? Maybe, maybe I can say something about yeah. uh, that just so we go as quickly as possible. The, the different institution thing, it is bureaucratically in some limited instances, technically possible. There has to be an extremely good reason for why you would want a co-supervisor from a different institution. It does happen. I did it in my PhD. Um, often it'll be something like a curator at a museum for a collaborative uh, museum to university PhD or something like that. There's a, there's a paperwork trail there where we have to demonstrate to the university um, the sustainability of an arrangement like that and it can only ever be with a internal supervisor as well so that's the sort of case where it would be worth contacting a potential supervisor before the application is sent but in general um you don't have to so the way the application process works and again this you know the, the details the specific details are on the website um but you suggest a supervisor, you sort of self-recommend a supervisor as part of the application. Um, but supervisor allocate, you don't apply to the supervisor, you apply to the postgraduate committee in digital humanities. Um, and what they will do is they'll allocate a supervisor to students who are given an offer. And that will depend on many different things. You know, is the person on sabbatical or not? Um, how many students are allocated? What is the fit? What do we expect the directions to be of the research, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yes, you do apply to the central program. No, it's not necessary to contact supervisors in advance. It's especially difficult for us to help uh, individual students applying because we don't want to make it unfair by giving loads of help to some people to write their proposals and not to others. But what we can do is answer questions about unconventional arrangements like, you know, working with another institution. Um, thanks, Leo. Maybe I could just add a little bit about the, the process for who you should contact, though. It, one thing we would really strongly say is that please don't contact individual members of staff with queries, write to um, the PhD at cbh.cam.ac.uk email address. If you have, particularly if you have queries that are more about the process related to the related to the degree, um, one of the reasons for that, as Leo says, is we are getting very large volume of people asking us um, uh, questions about you know, fit and so on between their potential project. And there is quite a limited amount that we can do for individual applicants at this at this stage. Um, it's, you know, I appreciate that that can be a bit um, difficult because sometimes there are questions that you do want to ask, but it's really, it's a very good idea to, or you could all write to the PhD email address and copy us in so that we can see and then reply if we feel we are going to. I mean, just personally, I have received very, very large numbers of these emails and that just, I will be much slower at answering them if they've only come to me. You'll get a quicker answer if you send them to the team that is over overseeing this, because then someone can pick up on any urgent parts of your of your query, even if the individual person you've asked is not available to do it. So it's just a plea to try and direct things through that PhD email address. Um, in terms of, uh, let's just pick up a few more a few more questions. Um, and try and read. So there's a question about, is the 80,000 words thesis a monograph or can it be a collection of papers? Um, I don't know if anyone again from the panel wants to pick up on that. Uh, Hugo, do you, do you want to answer that question maybe? Sorry. So the question, the question is, uh, the thesis, is it a single monograph or can it be a collection of papers? 
Yeah, so the, the tradition in, 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 in Cambridge is uh, for a, a full uh, monograph. Um, for example, in the uh, MPhil, we have uh, introduced uh, a portfolio, which is not the case uh, with a PhD. Um, we know that in different departments, there is in economics, for example, there is the tradition of aggregating two or three papers and presenting it as uh, as the final dissertation, as a, a final PhD thesis. Um, this usually is not the case uh, in the English department, and uh, it's not the ideal outcome as well. However, uh, technically, or I, I should say, Legally, according to the rules, I'm not sure we cannot do it. So I'll refer to one of my colleagues uh, as <clears throat> to have a second opinion about this, because I'm not sure you cannot do it. Yeah, so the I mean, the, the Cambridge rules are pretty, pretty simple. Uh, the thesis is one coherent document. There are many subjects, computer science included, uh, where, you know, I have a lot of interactions um, where people still basically do a PhD by publishing papers. And then what they do is they link them together, rephrase some bits, extract some bits, write an introduction conclusion, and then that's a PhD. The specifics of that will depend entirely on the project. You know, there are areas where that's not the most appropriate way, the most appropriate mode, the most appropriate format to proceed. And there are areas where it is. Um, so we're very open, we're very flexible. Formally speaking, you can't do the Dutch style thing of saying, here are my five papers. This is literally my PhD thesis. But um, in practice, there are versions of the monograph that are closer or further away uh, to that model. Fantastic. Thanks, Leo. So um, just trying to go through some of the questions. So um, there's some, um, I can see those questions coming in about the uh, writing sample um actually yeah could we come back to you for those questions that relate to um including uh, non-academic samples um in the in the writing sample and how do you include in, or in the in terms of prior work and coming from a fine arts degree um where you don't get distinction or merit how can we showcase academic research capability i believe there's also actually that would address another question where somebody was asking about again coming from the RCA. So if you could deal with those, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Anne. Um, this is a really important uh, point because actually we really want to encourage people from, well, what we want to do is build a cohort that is as diverse as possible, including maybe, if you like, intellectual um, diversity. And a really important part of that, especially in my world, frankly, which is kind of digital arts and um, AI applied to cultural history, is people with an art background. We've had very, very, very successful graduate students, um, masters and PhD with backgrounds in the arts um, as practicing artists or from art colleges. And Actually, often these give many of the kinds of skill sets that are very compatible with digital humanities, you know, a mix of theory and programming expertise, for instance, in a sort of creative computing environment. Not always, but um, often. Again, you don't have to have creative computing. It's just an example. Um, we are, we look at every application very, very carefully. Um, we really do read the materials and we really do think about individual circumstances. So it's not a box ticking exercise. So if your institution doesn't give a merit, it's okay to not have a merit, obviously. Now, if you flag that up in your letter, we'll be even more likely to spot it because um, that will you know, be brought to our attention very quickly. Um, but that also sort of, I think, addresses, uh, I'm now scrolling down to see if I can find it, but you know, what the weighting is between prior conference experience and publications and the research proposal, and we'd say we, we really do take every application on its own terms um, in a subject as sort of internally heterogeneous as digital humanities. It's impossible not to do that. Right? I mean, if we were doing a PhD in maths, we could just see how good at maths you are and then we take them. But we have people coming from such different institutions, such different backgrounds, such different career paths that we really do have to make judgments 
uh, individually about the potential to succeed in a PhD program in the end and to contribute to CDH's research culture. Um, so again, the, the weightings, they change. They change on individual uh, candidates on a case-by-case -case basis. The attention that is given, therefore, to grades change depending on the institution, depending on how relevant it is to a student's career pathway. Again, a grade that you got 10 years ago is going to be re less directly indicative of your performance than a grade that you got last year. So there are all sorts of, of, of factors to consider there. And I think in the end, if you make a, a sort of reasonable argument, um, then uh, that's that's the best way to get to us. That brings me to the question of submitting work that isn't traditional academic work in the writing sample. Um, what we say to MPhil applicants is, please, please, please give us evidence of your ability to write good academic prose because you're going to have to two months after you get here. With PhDs, we can afford to be slightly more flexible. It's important that you do show us the ability to write convincingly um, and the ability to engage with academic writing at the highest level. Now, of course, someone who's come from, you know, a literary studies background will have done more writing than somebody who's come from a computer science background, for instance. So we also acknowledge that there are inevitable disciplinary differences there. If you're going to submit significant amounts of work that are not, if you like, um, word-based and therefore not really compatible with our word limit, which I think is 7,000 words for uh, writing samples or samples of work, then please try to make a reasonable estimate of the amount of time you want people to engage with your work. So um, the 7,000 word limit is partly because we have to read everything that comes to us quite carefully. And so try and translate, if, you, if you're gonna submit, you know, a 4,000 word piece and a portfolio, try and translate that into something that you think deserves roughly the same amount of attention. Um, brilliant, thank you, Leo. Um, so there's a few questions around collaboration with other departments. Um, I, I can say something about that and um, perhaps other people on the panel might want to come in as well. So there was a question specifically about, you know, imagine if you have a very interdisciplinary proposal, um, how how would it work in terms of supervisors across different departments and so on. Um, oh, so if you are accepted at CDH to do the PhD, then you know, the expectation is that your supervisor would be from the CDH team. Um, it is possible to have co-supervisors in other departments, for example, I'm at the moment, co-supervising a PhD, which where the principal supervisor was in history. So if there, there could be a circumstance where you'd have your principal supervisor in CDH, and then um, by mutual agreement with a colleague in a different department where there was you know, an, an overlap with a particular set of skills, interests, and so on, uh, they would come in as a, as a kind of secondary supervisor for, for you. Um, so that is something that is possible. But even without... Even if your, um, you know, your primary supervisor is in, is in CDH, there are still plenty of ways in which you can collaborate with people in other departments. Um, there'd be you know, opportunities to engage with with those departments through things like seminars, workshops, um, to potentially build collaborations, uh, you know, to be involved with uh, research activities with people in the departments. There are lots of different ways in which you can be part of a wider kind of ecosystem of people in the same areas of research. We very much encourage CDH is, is overall a very um, broad and interdisciplinary place. Um, we have roots out into all sorts of different disciplines and departments. And you know we work often alongside other institutions that are you know, working in a similar way across different interfaces between, for example, social sciences and technology or uh, different human you know, humanities, um, humanities disciplines. I think there was um, actually a specific question about, for example, um, uh, CHIA and the other, other research centres that work around kind of approaches to AI. And yes, these are all, uh, you know, there's there's quite a lot of scope for collaboration um, and so on. Um, I'm just looking through the questions. I'll pick out a few more in terms of 
uh, does it need to answer? There was a question, I was wondering if Julia, you wanted to comment, there was a question about text mining specifically and text analysis and using languages other than English. Um, and so I wondered if that was something you wanted to perhaps comment on whether that's, you know, whether, whether we can uh, yeah, um, research that is in, not in, not in English. I do deal with text mining and I did work myself with a few other languages than English. Um, I would assume that the answer also relates to whether there would be someone maybe in CDH relating, uh, able to, you know, to accompany you researching on a specific language and or maybe there would be a case where a support from a, you know, um, a sister department or someone specifically dealing with that kind of language could uh, could help if it's Japanese or Chinese or another language that maybe the the person your person reference in, in within CDH does not necessarily deal with and if that is a complication I mean that would be a case where maybe an external could help but also in general in terms of you know the approaches and the kind of practices of text mind that you could do with English you could probably do with other languages without um, without you know enormous obstacles so I would not see that as an impossible as an impossible task if I can just add to that, um, Julia, Julia is an, the expert in NLP in our team. So, you know, uh, she uh, she has a much better idea over the, the um, intellectual coherence of all of this. Just from an institutional point of view, I think there was also a question about uh, Chia and working with, I think the question was something like working with newer centres like Chia. Mm -hmm. um, this... I think is a, a really important point. A lot of these groups, including Chia, um, are cross university. So uh, I'm on the, I'm part of Chia and I'm on the Chia steering committee. And I'm also part of, for instance, Cambridge Visual Culture and the Institute for Technology and Humanity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of these things are very, very, very strongly networked. You know, many of us are members of Crash. So when we say working with X, um, often often those links already exist, and often we can find ways to make them productive within the within the scope of a DH PhD. I would say that Chia, with its uh, extensive NLP um, expertise, you know, in people like Anna Kohonen, would be a good partner for work on, for instance, historical language, NLP for historical languages or for under-resourced languages. Um, of course, there is a an angle there that needs to be found for why it sits within digital humanities and not computational linguistics. But if the approach is right, then I think that could be a really, um, you know, that could be exactly the kind of project where inter- Institutional collaboration is uh, is really important. Yeah, may I, if I may, elaborate even a bit more on top of what Julia said and what Leo said on language. Um, we really um, appreciate and value diversity and and the fact that our MPhil, for example. Uh, has students from all over the world. Having said that, the language of both the M field and the PhD is English. And although we do welcome work in other languages, please be aware that when you present that work, you will have to present translations of languages that are not English. So when you write your PhD, uh, imagine on... Uh, a network analysis of uh, a, a, a Chinese network, for example, so and or a semantic analysis, you'd have to translate part of that work into English in order to be accessible to your examiners. Because the language of the PhD is English. Okay, I just wanted to be very clear uh, uh, about this uh, because again. Diversity is key, but the language is English. Um, brilliant, thank you, Hugo. Um, sorry, would you, would you cover the, there was a question that was about um, the difference between computational, so 
social sciences and digital humanities and I wonder if you want to speak on that question. It, yeah, so sorry, there's something back on my mind in the same room. So methodologically, there's an overlap. So it depends on the angle you approach. If you think of the methods only, let's not create disciplinary boundaries where they do not exist. Digital humanities is, a, is an interdisciplinary field, I would say transdisciplinary even, that at times um, adopts digital methods, not necessarily. Whereas uh, computational uh, social scientists always adopt some kind of digital method, right? Or computational method. So that's, th there you see the, the overlap and the difference. So digital humanities goes beyond digital methods, whereas computational social sciences by definition is just a computation. Uh, element and it's it's a method only. So uh, be when you apply, do look at at the fit and at the disciplinary uh, disciplinary I would say interdisciplinary angle of your research proposal. Do not I wouldn't invite you to anchor yourself in in a discipline if you do not feel anchored in a discipline. It's from my point of view, as, as I've just turned to myself as someone who's all over the place, being all over the place means that you are able to engage with different disciplines, with different strands of literature, with different methods. And that is welcome in, in, in digital humanities. That is uh, our remit, I would say, which is to uh, excellent. work with those people and, and have some convergence around topics that are specifically uh, uh, digital humanities topics, uh, but, but the disciplinary transcend what people would consider to be digital humanities. Um, thanks very much, Hugo. Um, maybe I'll come to Julia, because you had a question you wanted to answer, which was around um, opportunities to benefit from the department by sw on switching from a thesis to a project. Do you want to take that question? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I, I read it in, in that sense. I, I thought it was more about uh, someone asking rather whether having another job practically and being busy is, is, is that some kind of alternative way to approach a PhD. My kind of immediate answer is maybe not really in as in that maybe the alternative would be a part-time for this kind of situation where you have another job you don't think you have a full time uh, to dedicate to a phd phd is a full-time job is the first experience as a researcher and that writing the thesis is part of that job is actually your main objective to finish to ma manage to finish a thesis uh, written within those three or four years and that is your full-time job for the PhD so if you don't think that you have the time to do that then a, a part-time might be an option an alternative option if you are just looking into a collaboration maybe visiting you could be a visiting scholar I mean you're if you're working if you want just the experience or getting in touch there are alternative things to do um, do not you know my advice is do not think PhD is something to be taken lightly it's it is a job. When once you step in, that is your full time job. Thanks very much, Julia. Maybe I could come to Leo because I see there are a few questions that you wanted to pick up on. Yeah, uh, thanks also, Sarah, for, for pointing this out in the chat. Um, so there's a few questions about practice based proposals. Let me refresh my memory on exactly what they are. Oh, there's too many windows floating around. Uh, one of them is about, oh, here we are. One of them is about, okay, one of them is about the, the fit between the research proposal and the writing sample, which maybe I will say a few words about in a second. Um, so there's one question on, do we accept practice-based PhD proposals? And there is one about creative outputs alongside their Theses. Is this a possible command of the PhD thesis? Okay. 
in general, I'm really interested in, um, as I said, the overlap between creative practice, artistic research, and the digital humanities. I think there are many, many interesting resonances there. They're not the same thing, but they do often uh, have, you know, harmonious points of contact. The formal structure of the MPhil, as one of the uh, participants rightly raises, means that we can accept portfolios as well as dissertations. Now, in the end, those portfolios have just as many words as the dissertations. They just have a slightly different structure in terms of how the words are distributed and what other appendices we accept, expect. In the PhD, we have no such provision, but it is quite normal to have in interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary PhD projects, significant appendices for practice-based projects, we might say. So if you are a filmmaker, or if you are a um, textile artisan, or if you are a computer programmer, or if you are uh, a practitioner and scholar of dance, or whatever it might be, um, there is the opportunity to add appendices to your PhD thesis as what you know whatever kind of file type you negotiate basically with the committee um that means that that kind of work is counted as work towards your phd but of course you have to make an argument as to why it's scientifically academically relevant rigorous interesting new um shareable epistemologically relevant etc um so it can't just be good art uh, there i hope that addresses the practice-based PhD proposals. Um, so yes, we're, we're extremely interested in this area, extremely interested, but um, we're not an art school. So there's a limit on the amount of guidance we can give on that side. And we expect practice-based artistic research, et cetera, work to lead to demonstrable, um, if you like, intellectual progress. It doesn't necessarily have to be epistemologically traditional, let's say, but it does have to be new and interesting. Um, last quick point about the relationship between the sample of work and the proposal. In general, we say the most important thing about the sample of work is that it's good. Um, if you can find stuff that is also relevant, then that's great, that's an added bonus. But the most important thing, the thing we're really looking for is good work um, and that means well-argued work it means interesting work it means work that pushes new boundaries it doesn't primarily serve as a document that proves your interest in the discipline of digital humanities it might also do that but primarily it's about your if you like well-rounded intellectual ability to think reason write uh, argue etc hope that clears that up Thanks very much, Leo. I'm afraid we're coming towards the end of the time for the session. I've got a couple of quick questions that I will take up. Um, I don't know if maybe, Leo, can you just quickly, there was a question about the word count, the research proposal. Um, do you happen to know the answer to that very briefly? Or somebody could answer that uh, question. Uh, does it include the 800 word, 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 word count exclude references and bibliography? Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember. I imagine it's the sort of thing that is detailed on the website. Uh, I'm not sure if Anna has maybe any some, Maybe somebody could share in the in the chat or something, an answer, that we, a place that would give Thanks. that. Um, so um, there was a question about um, that this is a distance program and expectation of being present for a certain number of days and whether seminars or other opportunities are offered in hybrid format or in person. So I think the thing that, the thing to note here that the teacher, the expectation is teaching is face to face by default. Um, there, you know, there, there could be occasions, for example, uh, you know, where a PhD supervision might, might, might be done remotely, but the expectation is that it's in person and certainly seminars and anything and, you know, the rest of the teaching that's offered in our, um, in the courses or other activities that you might want to get involved with um, are, you know, are, are going to take place in, in person. Um, I mean, in terms of, um, you know, in, in terms of people who are commuting and so on um, for, you know, to come, to come into, uh, to study, 
then I guess this with a PhD program, particularly if you're doing it part time, there'd be some flexibility about you know arranging um, so as to maximise the convenience for um, you know the face to face time that you would have. But as far as I'm, I'm aware, the expectation is that that it's taught in person. Um, there was also a question um, uh, from somebody who says, "I'm a finance professional. Does this course benefit people whose focus is in alternative investments, e.g., around digital art?" I think the answer to that is similar to what other people have emphasised, that this is a research training degree. If you are interested in carrying out a piece of independent research, um, as in you have you know, a set of intellectual questions that you want to, you believe you can find answers to, which could be related to this area, could be related to the, the digital, digital art world, um, then yes, it could, it could benefit you. It's something that could, um, you know, you could you you could then feed back into uh, into your professional work. Um, but it, you have to have a research project, an idea for a set of research questions you want to answer, and be prepared to relate them to academic work in this area, so that you would be trying to engage with a, a scholarship in this in the in the in the area that you're interested in. Um, so it's not something that has you know, there is a, it can feed back into your career and into, into developing, uh, into developing that, that it's, um, it, you have to have a project that, that works in, in it for its own sake, if you like. Um, um, there's perhaps, one, let's just take um, one more question uh, in terms of the question about how finalised should the proposal output and methodology be, uh, presumably being the research proposal. I don't know, Hugo, do you want any last thoughts on, on this before we wrap up? Yeah, well, it's at this point, uh, the, the difference between your PhD and, and an MPhil is that in the MPhil, you have nine months to work on your dissertation. Actually, you will have three or four to work on your dissertation. During the PhD, you will have time to develop all parts of that of that PhD. So the methodology at that point is indicative. And imagine you want to code or apply digital methods that you're not very familiar with yet, but you're willing to invest during your PhD, then by all means do introduce them in your in your proposal because you will have time to address that during your PhD. You do not have to be a computer scientist or an expert in computational methods and or digital methods in order to include a part, a section uh, that deals with uh, uh, digital methods on your proposal. Okay. <clears throat> Fantastic. Thanks. Very much, Hugo. Um, so I'm afraid we're going to have to finish up there. Um, I hope we've answered pretty much everybody's questions. As I said, this is going to be sessions being recorded and will be available afterwards. Um, and thank you very much for everyone who joined the session. Thank you to everyone who um, took part in it from our panel. Um, and we look forward to reading your applications. Please do contact phd at cbh.cam.ac.uk if you've got further queries. And uh, thanks again for coming. Thanks. Thanks for coming, everyone. Wonderful. Thank you.